Okay. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Good evening to people here. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you this afternoon or evening um, on field methods in snow hydrology. Um, it would be a pleasure to do it in the field, uh, but that is not possible this year. So hopefully this uh, webinar and the series of webinars will provide some insight into snow hydrology, making methods, making measurements, but also understanding remote sensing of snow, modeling of snow, and uh, thinking of how snow fits in the larger scientific um, environment, part of environmental sciences. So um, today, um, myself and Alex are gonna talk through some concepts surrounding making field measurements and also some of the detail. Um, I'm based at Northumbria University, which is in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. And Alex is at the University de Sherbrooke in Canada. So I'll let him introduce himself and he'll start with the first few slides. Thank you, Nick, and thanks everyone for, for logging in. So yeah, as, as Nick said, uh, unfortunately no, no field school for us this year, but uh, anyway, we do what we can with uh, what we have. So I'm Alex at Sherbrooke University in Quebec, Canada, Eastern Canada. And uh, so I've been doing uh, Arctic work for the past uh, 15, 20 years. And uh, yeah, so today uh, we'll go over some, some slides on different measurements, no importance, some remote sensing, some of the products that are exist out there. And uh, we'll have some sort of a break um, uh, in the middle of the, of the presentation and Nick will explain what we want to do with this. And otherwise, uh, we can go to the plan of presentation on the next slide, please, for Julia. And um, so basically, we're going to go over importance of snow. I'll kick, uh, I'll give it a start. And uh, after that, Nick will carry on with special scaling issues with massive microstructure, we'll go over some existing products, whether they're modeling and remote sensing, what's out there. Uh, I'll do that and then Nick will take over on metamorphism and we'll share at the end some of the measurements, tools or basic or, or methods that uh, are available in the field and for everything else. So on the next slide for importance of snow, I, I guess it's no secret or perhaps it's, it's hard to have a, a, a grasp on, on, on the expertise of uh, the audience right now. But um, overall, we really need to understand that snow is very, very highly variable. Uh, if you just take North America, for instance, there's maximal coverage of about 40 million square kilometers, the maximum, which is uh, in January or February in the middle of the, of the winter. And that goes down to just below 2 million square kilometers. So this is an, a huge difference in terms of spatial coverage and also in terms of uh, energy surface energy balance impact. So you go from um, an area that has 80, 90, 95 percent, you know, reflecting the solar radiation to down to 15 or 20. So it's a huge contrast that you know can reach up to 200 watts per meter square. So there's no other changes on this on, on the earth that actually lead to such a such a gap. Um, snow really is highly variable, not only spatially, but it is also temporarily, temporarily as you can see on the graph, but we also tend to forget that it's also highly variable vertically. And Nick will go over some of the details uh, with regards to this uh, later on. Uh, minimum record that was observed, I think this is still up to date. I've kind of <laughs> looked at stats yesterday again, and 2012 uh, still looked at the uh, minimum extent, at least uh, the highest uh, negative anomaly, which is on the next slide, where you can look at, you know, with satellite imagery, there's an animation there where you can look at anomaly based on the 1981 to 2010 average uh, for the Northern Hemisphere. So. At the beginning of the satellite era in the 70s, we were in positive anomalies with regards to that average. So it means more snow every year than, than, than the average. And then in the you know, early 2000s, um, really there was a, a, very, a trend toward negative anomalies that was actually quite significant. And it's hard to see if it increases or not. Uh, there's a the notion of the Arctic amplification you know, further, further north. Uh, it's hard to make those link with regard to, you know, spatial coverage, at least snow mass uh, for, um, for snow, at least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but anyway, it, it remains pretty hard to establish a really clear trend to say, you know, what snow will be like at the horizon 2100. Uh, but it, nonetheless, this is a pretty, pretty nice, um, pretty nice animation. And I, I think the link is there, at least if you go on nicdc.org. Uh, plenty of animations and tools that you can use in any presentation. So um, I invite you guys to go and visit that website. On the next slide, you know, the fact that we're losing snow 
extent and mass. Um, why, why is this a problem? Well, it is a problem when you think that, you know, more than a sixth of the world's population, which is just over a billion people, rely on seasonal snowpack and glacier for fresh water. And also for, for river flow, there's a very, very strong dependence on, uh, on mountain snow and not only mountain snow, but, you know, snow in general. And you can, you know, freshwater resources, you can look into this, but you can also look into the impact on geohazards, uh, such as uh, flooding, for instance, which in Canada, especially in the prairies, every year is a problem. And also in, in my province in Quebec, Eastern Canada, every year, melting snow is a problem causing flash floods. Um, snow also has a, a very strong economic importance for, for tourism and recreation, hydropower production. For instance, in, in Quebec, we work with... Uh, Hydro-Quebec, so I think we're one of the largest in the world of producers of, of hydroelectricity. And um, we actually work with them to try and see to the horizon, you know, 2050 or 2075, 2100, what will be the snow mass available in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, for them in their watershed to be able to see, you know, what's the forecast in hydroelectricity could be later on. And on the figure you see on the right, it looks like uh, somewhere in Switzerland, I stole that from the web. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun to see, but it, it's a huge problem. And no later than last year, I was at Col du Lettare for snow school in France. And everywhere in the Alps, it, you know, ski season are worse and worse and worse every year. Uh, here in Quebec, same thing, worse and worse. We started skiing in January this year. So it's like a month and a half later than, than usual. So, you know, there's, there, there's something going on with snow extent and mass. And um, the reason why, if you go on the next slide, you know, the focus on of the community that me and Nick are in really is to, to look at critical snow questions. And I put the link here for a, a document that was actually prepared uh, at the early stages of Center, uh, God Snow. It's actually a pretty nice pamphlet with, you know, the highlighting the importance of snow globally, not only for US or Sierra Nevada or Canada or for skiing, but globally as, as a resource for, for, for freshwater, hydroelectricity, et cetera. Um, right now, you have industry agencies, decision makers that need that information uh, to respond to altering climate and, and that water resources that is actually uh, disappearing. Um, they need to predict future snow resources, and this basically um, triggers four critical questions. You know, the first one would be the aerial extent and location of snow. So what does it cover in terms of space and where is it? And how long does it stay on the ground, which would be the second question. And eventually, the depth and sweep snow water equivalent. Uh, it, it, it's one thing to say there's snow on the ground. It's another thing to say how deep it is. And, you know, what's the basically the millimeters of water that you get if you melt the snowpack, which is critical to uh, what we just said. And, you know, as a global question, how is this changing? So those critical questions kind of trigger some, some scientific uh, thinking and you know which motivates uh, space mission concepts for instance that we're also involved in and you know research projects that are core to you know my own research program and Nick's, and Nick's program. So we really need improve empirical understanding on what causes the change that we see in snow variability whether it's spatial, temporal, and you know we could add here on that sentence uh, vertical. So quick grasp on you know role of snow, importance of snow, and um, into further details, I'll pass on to Nick for scaling issues. That's great. Okay, thanks, Alex. So that was a really nice overview of some of the importance, particularly from a hydrological context. I mean, Alex touched on the fact of its impact on the atmosphere. We could have also gone on to talk about the impact on permafrost, on carbon, on thawing of the active layer. It really is you know, a really central point to any understanding of environmental systems. But sticking with a more hydrological focus, we can start thinking about potentially, you know, about measurements. And where do you start with trying to measure snow? And the first, one of the first ways of thinking about this is how does it change over space and over time? So really, what is the geography of a snowpack? So here's just a few pictures, really, just to start getting us thinking about some of the spatial variability that we'd have to take into account. So if you look at the top right-hand side photograph and just ask yourself, where is the snow? So I'll give yourself just a couple of moments to look at that photograph and think, where is there snow and where is there no snow? 
When you start to ordinarily pick out patterns, the snow tends to be in the gullies. It tends to not be on the exposed ridges. So we're now starting to think about the influence of topography, where things are convex, where things are concave, and can we generalize about potentially where we might find snow, and that will affect the depth, will affect the time or the duration of the snow lasting there through a year. It also will start to show patterns as something become melts out, and they might be repetitive over years, which you know certainly in the past a lot of people have used to try and have some very rudimentary understanding of the hydrological point or the, the points in the hydrological cycles. But you can see areas there where you've got quite a lot of snow, and then where you've got no snow. And the fact, the fact is, it's changing over really, really short spatial scales from nothing to potentially quite a lot. So the text on the side there really hooks thumbs that up and says, seasonal snow is a really highly heterogeneous dynamic medium. It changes over very short scales. And depending on the purpose of your scientific question, you know, the amount of measurements that you need to characterize that will change. So if you look down now on the bottom left-hand side, I'm thinking more maybe towards a landscape scale. Now this is a picture of a valley. Uh, it's in the Yukon, so a Northern hemisphere, and the river in the base of it is running pretty much east to west. And you can see there areas with snow or without snow. And that's a function clearly of um, the south, southern facing slope becoming warmer because it has more of the sun's energy um, and therefore that melts earlier. But if we're just thinking about where the water is coming from in that catchment, the orientation of the valley and the timing of the melt is massively controlled there um, by that situation. On the bottom right, you can look and say, again, where is the snow? And clearly, on this, I think this is from the Pacific Northwest, uh, but elevation is the key control at that point. So we can kind of see where the zero degree isotherm is, so above it where it's colder and the snow remains, and beneath it when it's warmer <coughs> and it melts the snow. So when we're thinking about um, potential science questions, thinking about the hydrology of these areas over really small scales of catchments to larger, larger valleys to maybe very large um, uh, catchments such as you know, the Colorado uh, or even the Mackenzie to think of really big rivers. We need to start thinking about some of these scaling questions. Next slide, please, Julia. It would also be unwise not to think about vegetation too. So if we look at the bottom right hand uh, sort of, uh, diagram, that's uh, an author photograph from a, pre uh, a project that happened in about 2002. And what we can see there, it's a one by one uh, kilometer grid. And you can see where the coniferous trees are, kind of ribbon forests up in Buffalo Pass in Colorado. And as the snow starts to melt out, you can start to see the patterns. And the patterns start to give away some understanding of how that snow has built up. So you can see where the trees have basically reduced the wind speeds, causing snow to drop. You can see where trees have caused shading to um, have sort of preferentially protect or melt snow. And so there's lots of complex interactions between the atmosphere and the energy balance and the trees having a key control over the distribution of the snowpack there. On the bottom left, we can see snow there being intercepted by coniferous trees. And a lot of that, that mass of snow will be lost back to the atmosphere through sublimation. Hopefully you can also see right at the bottom some tree wells. So the interception getting in the way of the snow reaching the ground completely. And so we start to have variability in the snowpack under a forest. And on the top right, albeit an oblique photograph, I think this is in, again Wolf Creek in the Yukon, you start to see the effect of shrubs. And in kind of areas where you don't have a lot of trees, shrubs can be absolutely critical in maintaining snow and basically protecting snow within the gaps and within the structure of the vegetation itself. And so vegetation, the patterns thereof, have a massive influence on snow, which then in turn have a massive influence on the biology and ecological functioning of the system. So there's an awful lot to go at, even with just, you know, with some uh, examples like that. Okay, next slide please, Julia. So how do we start to even get a hold of this, this question? So just a couple of ideas of how people have measured snow to try and give you an idea of the complexity of the problem. So in terms of thinking about the spatial scaling, it's not just the depth of snow, but it's also what's the characteristics or the properties of snow. And the microstructure is a good way of describing that. So what you can see there in the photograph, that's Andy Gleason and Hans-Peter Marshall making some measurements of snow using a, a ground penetrating radar. Um, you don't need to know the nuts and bolts. In essence, it fires out energy, returns the signal, and it can interpret some of the returns within the snowpack because of the nature of the, the frequency modulated uh, or continuous radar. Um, next slide, please. 
And this is a graph or sort of a pictogram from this. So this is using this uh, radar and it's been dragged over about 1.6 kilometers in Colorado in an area called Muddy Creek. Now, superficially on the surface, you don't see much change in the snow. But as you can see the different colors, that is a, um, describing the strength of the radar return. Now, the bottom uh, return is where the snow hits the, sorry, where the snow um, interface is with the soil and the, and the ground. But within that, what I want you to show from this is that you can see lots of internal structuring. So in essence, we're starting to see the buildup of the snowpack over the year. So this was a measurement taken in February. And so in Colorado by then, that has repeated cycles of precipitation. And we can start to see that snow build up. And there's clearly a structure to what's going on within the snowpack. And that has a really big influence on potential ability to use remote sensing to retrieve characteristics, in particular the water equivalent. So what's interesting there is over about 1.6 kilometers, you can see consistent patterns within the snowpack. Those lines, these wiggles that you can see, they join up and there's a lot of continuous nature to that. So deep alpine snowpacks, areas like Colorado, you can often see uh, the variability just in the depth, but also the variability in the structure. Okay, next slide, please. So that's all well and good if you've got really deep snowpacks, but what happens if you work in the Arctic? Because you're getting much more shallow snowpacks, and how does that structure uh, change within there? So often, to get into it, you've got to get into it and scratch in and do make, create a trench. So we've got some examples here of a five meter trench and a partial shot on the right hand side of a 50 meter trench. And by digging into the snowpack there and looking at how the layering changes, we can start to get an idea of some of the complexity of the processes which actually create this, uh, this microstructure. Next slide, please. So some of the work there was inspired a lot by Matthew Sturm's work. Um, and uh, what you have there is a really nice sort of pictor pictogram of how the structure of an Arctic snowpack, a tundra snowpack changes. Um, you can notice that, so that's over 10 meters on the x-axis. On the y-axis, it's disproportionate, it's only 80 centimeters in height. But the, thing, the key thing to take from there is the complexity of the different types of microstructure, but also the discontinuity of those layers as you go across a distance of only even 10 meters. So if you're thinking about doing a pit, for example, and trying to take a single profile, you've got to start wondering how representative is that profile of larger spatial areas. So we can kind of make some gross assumptions that you're likely to have depth thaw towards the bottom, and we'll discuss that later. You might have some wind slabs, some hard layers. You might have some soft, low density snow on the top. But fundamentally, the reality is there's a massive amount of complexity. And that's a lovely uh, pictogram there, which describes that. Okay, Julia, next slide, please. So to take that on, because Matthew and colleagues just basically dug a trench and put a ruler every 10 centimeters or so, and actually just made a, uh, an estimate using traditional techniques. You can use perhaps even like new infrared photography to actually start to quantify the structure of the surface. So the spectral response of snow in the near infrared part of the spectrum allows for the differential sort of um, the differences between um, large grains and small grains to be picked out much more easily. So by creating this kind of stitched image of near infrared photographs, which you can see on the top there, you can create something a little bit like what's on the base there. So a kind of a map, so very high resolution. So centimeter resolution changes in the layering, and then you can then apply different um, structural characteristics to each layer. So we can actually quantify over quite large areas how these um, layers are changing. Um, next slide, please. Okay, that's over to Alex now to take it on to influences on existing products. Sorry, um, there are two questions on the chat. Perhaps, Nick, you want to look into one or I can answer later. You're on mute anyway. Um, thanks. All right, so we'll do that later. But yeah, we've, we've, we're seeing the... Um, we saw the questions, so don't don't be shy of uh, putting in more more questions into into the chat. We'll we'll get to them. Uh, we promise. Um, so from 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 that variability perspective, which is actually extremely high in terms of not only depth but really stratigraphy, as as Nick pointed out, that Nick's too humble to you know to show figures on his own paper. 
uh, from Churchill, but again, same, same, same conclusions, An extremely high variability that leads into, you know, a very complex remote sensing problem when you do remote sensing problem. If you want to scale it back to have some northern hemisphere signal of snow, um, from that scale and context, you know, products do exist. Uh, you, whether it's a remote sensing product from passive microwaves or MODIS, or whether it's a model like IMS or reanalysis or ERA, uh, products are there at different scales. Um, they can provide fair estimate, I think, on, on spatial extent, but mass always remains a problem, like how thick, how dense, what's the SWE? So that's the critical questions that we're getting into as a community, which again, motivates the, you know, the desire to design space missions, addressing those questions. Uh, if you look at the variability in, in the Northern hemisphere mass on, on the right graph, on the, you know, the, gra the graph on the right from different products, then there's almost a factor of two between, you know, GL DAS and, and Globe Snow or, or ERA, interim, I understand these, these are ERA interim. Um, so basically it's a factor of two in difference in snow mass. So this is actually huge. So mass is, is not quite good just yet um, because of the scaling issues and the variability that Nick just, just, just talked about. If you go on the next slides, uh, you know, the challenge is not really the lack of data. Like we do have them, modeling and remote sensing. So we do have that. There is a list of product here that, and the associated resolution or temporal coverage. Uh, and, you know, that's a nice symbol and you keep, keep that for reference and I invite you know, everyone to who's interested to actually go and, and read those papers from, from colleagues that actually great done the great work doing their best, you know, quantifying depth, ex extent, and, and SWE globally. Uh, so, so products are there typically would cover from late 70s to, to today. And option exists at different scale. But again, the question is how precise are they? How precise is the 25 by 25 easy grid kilometer SWE? Um, given the variability that we just discussed. So this remains very, very hard to quantify. And if you look at the next slide, um, next slide, uh, is it frozen? No, oh, there you go. Yeah. The challenge really is uh, representativeness and scale. And me and Nick last year at the snow school and actually every snow school that, that I attend or teach, I always discuss this, problem of special representativeness. And in my own group, our own research, I've only been doing proper site selection for the past 10 years. Uh, it's really hard to say, you know, if you're to, to dig a pit or take a measurement, well, where do you do it? Uh, if you look at the, the photo on the bottom right at the med station, this is a med station from, from Churchill, Manitoba. And then you have the med station that will be equipped with a, a typical classical uh, Campbell SR50 and ultrasound snow depth system. And that will give you like 30, 35, 40 centimeters of, of snow thickness. But then you look around and globally, there's no snow. These are just drifts, you know, late spring, perhaps, you know, end of April, early May. So if you're basically calibrating your algorithm at 25 by 25 kilometers, and then, you know, you bring your model to 35 centimeters of snow, you can imagine the amount of overestimation of fresh water you're putting into your system. Same with models, same with remote sensing, same with um, reanalysis. It's the same problem. Um, the measurement deficiencies, really, the, the way you design your, your measurement, your transex differs. That you know, there are standards, but not really official standards. So even if you have field measurements, that becomes a problem because it's not reported the same way. Uh, so this is when I what I mean when I mean poor reporting practices. It's not that what people do is not good. It's the way we report it as a community that uh, still needs a lot of work. Um, yeah, so no, just go stay to, stay to the, <laughs> so here's just a map of a snow observation site in Canada, just to give you guys a sense of an idea, just something to think about. When you look at the density of station that are used to calibrate a model or an algorithm, you know, some areas would work well. Let's say Alberta has a very dense network and Terrio not so much, but the further you go north, then very, very, very few. And this is where the snow is. So where you have the snow and where the snow is changing the most dramatically with the Arctic amplification and, you know, so on and so forth, this is a way you have basically clueless about what's underground. So that's, uh, 
that's the main issues and we'll get into those measurements uh, uh, in a bit. So yeah, so carry on for Nick. Okay, thanks. So Alex has been talking there about snow variability over the continental scale, thinking about maybe over you know, kilometer scale, talking about the scale there around the weather station, but we could also think about the scales within the snowpack at the millimeter and sub millimeter scale. And I think many of you that might be interested in how um, microwave energy might interact with the snowpack, then you're going to need to know something about the structure of the snowpack. If you're interested in the stability of the snowpack, avalanche forecasting and the like, you're going to want to know a lot about the structure. So um, one of the key um, processes to at least have be aware of is about metamorphism. Um, and fundamentally, this is when very strong temperature gradients are put through a snowpack. So the kind of the text at the base of this slide here subscribes saying that you know, metamorphism will happen a lot when you've got big temperature differences between the surface of the snow in the air and the, the surface of the, the ground and the snow. And that tends to happen when you've got shallow snowpacks. So the distance over which the temperature gradient would be applied is pretty small. So the two uh, kind of diagrams there, which are really cool descriptions pictorially of how metamorphism happens, and fundamentally, it's about having that temperature difference between the base of the snowpack and the surface. And a lot of that is a function of energy coming in from the, uh, from the sun, so shortwave solar energy coming in, causing uh, a warming of the surface, perhaps even melting. But you start to get convection. So the thought, you know, people, if you dig into the snow, you're thinking about a sort of a matrix of ice and air. You can think of it of kind of like a sort of a solid sponge where there's lots of porosity and there's lots of capacity for air to, to move around. Um, but there's also a capacity for, for mass and moisture to move around within that snow. So some of the key parts of the left-hand side there is the convection and vapor diffusion. So generally speaking, the vapor will diffuse upwards and that will happen sort of at different rates between daytime and nighttime. And it's that rapid change between day and night, between that surface temperature and the soil sort of temperature, surface temperature will change a lot, soil temperature will change much less, that you start having different rates of vapor diffusion and convection. Okay, next slide please, Julia. Thank you. Okay, so fundamentally what's happening? Um, I mean, there are far, far more qualified scientists than me to talk about this, but I like pictures, I like this diagram in particular, this animation. So we can think of the grains as spheres, they're not spheres, but we can think of them conceptually as such. And if you pile them all together, then you can start to think of how the energy will affect the vapor flow between these spheres. So hopefully what you can see, if you look at the left hand side, you've got the ground at the bottom and the sky towards the top, but you can start to see sort of particles of, of um, or molecules of uh, moisture move between the grains that are lower to the grains that are higher. And so you can start to get this transfer and that's a function of the difference in the temperature which the gradient forces that to happen. If we look on the right hand side and we just think about two grains together, you can see the loss of mass from the top of the lower grain and it basically being going up through the snowpack, condensing and adhering to the base of the grain above. And even if we just conceptualize about these spherical grains, we can start to see there's a change in the shape of the grain as a function of this. So they start to become more angular. They start to become sharper edges. Now, at the bottom there, you can see some snow which was basically put in liquid nitrogen and then taken photographs using scanning electron microscopy. The key thing to take from that is these are the creation of depth holes. So this happens particularly at the base of the snowpack when the snowpacks are nice and shallow. You've got reasonably warm ground and you get, you get a, a, um, some very cold air go over the top of it. And that creates these really sharp edges and you get crystals like you can see on the right hand side, these large um, depth four crystals with sharp edges that kind of get built up as you can see in the animation on the right hand side. Okay, next question, uh, next slide please, Julian. And here are some lovely photographs, um, um, photo macrographs here of crystals. Now, um, this is from Florent Domine's work. Um, and just kind of to get context, each of those bars that you can see in each of the different photographs, that's uh, one millimeter in size. So top left, A, that's like a depth or crystal. And hopefully what you can see, first of all, it's big. You know, that's maybe three to five millimeters in size. You can also see the irregular shape and you can see also the sharp edges where series or days of um, 
moisture have been basically lost from the, the grains below and adhering to the grains above. You can also see in B, you see more faceted crystals. So you can sell again, you start to see those sharp edges. We go to C, it's more about what's like a, called a polycrystal. That's just a really a word for them all being sort of adhered together. So lots that have been joined. And that again happens in maybe in F down the bottom left where we've had a sort of result of a melt freeze. In E, we're looking at crystals that maybe have melted or rounded or been compacted together. And in, uh, in D, there we're looking at again some of those melt freeze functions. Um, I think the take home message for this is particularly if you've never dug into a snowpack before, is that it's a very complex medium and there's a lot going on. So when the snow hits the ground, it doesn't just stay the same, it changes and it starts changing at different rates into different sizes and shapes over time. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and because of this, and because we can make some generalizations about snowpacks, this does allow us to give an idea of the type of structures that we might expect in different snow climatologies, different climatic regimes. So if we just look on the left hand side to start with, we look at two sort of very important uh, sort of snow climatologies. One is tundra snow and the other is tiger snow. So tiger generally is for boreal forests. So if you look at the tundra, you can see generally split into maybe three kind of categories. You've got depth hoar at the base, that's these inverted Vs. Then above that, we've got wind pack represented by the circles with a line through. And on top of that, we've got maybe mixed forms, potentially uh, some, um, uh, some decomposing snow potentially at the top. But you, know, you tend to have those three layers and while they might be very discontinuous horizontally, you tend to be able to pick those up quite regularly. So we can start to make some generalizations about levels of complexity. In tiger snowpack, so that's in the boreal forest, just generally speaking to the south of the tundra, you get similarities. We start to have the depth or the base that goes into potentially more faceted structures. We don't necessarily get that wind packing because the trees protect the snow for protect the snow from strong winds. So you don't necessarily get that. And then you might maybe more chance of getting those sort of decomposing crystals at the surface. Uh, again, because of the lack of wind forcing the saltation and the compaction of the snow. In contrast, if we look on to the right of the, of the, of the red box, you think of alpine snow. The key take home there is it tends to be more deep, it tends to be deeper and tends to be a bit more complex and a little more stochastic. So we can have maybe melt freeze uh, polycrystals right at the base. So perhaps the snow's formed on warm soil and it's melted. You've got maybe some depth hole within there that can cause a lot of avalanches, particularly in deep snow packs in sort of low latitudes. There's chances of it being wind slabs. If, uh, if at any point they're exposed, that's very much a, a function of um, exposure to winds or different, um, top, different aspects in particular are going to control that and a variety of mixed forms and different decomposing crystals. So it's complex, but within that complexity, we can start to pick out some sort of repeating patterns. Okay. Um, I will speed up a little bit uh, on this. So just to say that melt and refreeze is very important in there. So uh, experiment the top left there where you put food dye and watering can and spray it on and we'll look at it. Um, as the will, as the snow melts from top to bottom and it will basically refreeze within, you can think of it very much like a pervious rock, a bit like a limestone, and that it's looking for weaknesses and cracks and it forces uh, preferential flow pathways. Of course, this material will start to change very quickly when water flows on it, so we can start to use that layering and preferential flow pathways but also that will create ice lenses and crusts within the snowpack and they can be picked up from radar and they can be certainly have a big impact on remote sensing of snow. Next slide, please. And that will impact on the hardness. So while we're not quite yet into the measurements, we'll do that after the first discussion point. Um, we can think of, you know, how would you look at the, um, the hardness of a vertical profile? So within a snowpack, you know, generally if it's cold, you'll use either sort of your, your mitten and see, can you get the whole of your fist in there? That's very soft. And that will go down with various like four fingers, one finger, then you could hack at it with your pencil or your pen knife. And those are kind of fairly rudimentary, but interesting ways to show differences within that vertical profile. And on the right hand side there, the gray kind of um, area is that representative of the hardness uh, profile that you might see in a particular snowpack. So you go from fresh snow, which is very soft, and you get the whole fist in, to ice lenses, which are very hard, and you need a pen knife. Okay, next slide, please. Right. There's a lot of information. 
And so it's important to take some periods of time just to reflect. Um, there's over 100, of you, 100 people on this, so we're going to try something a bit different in order to try and allow five minutes just for reflection and thinking about how it relates. So um, if you could put the link in the chat, please, Julia. And then if you could put the jam board, please, on the screen. What we'd like you to do is in the chat, Julia's going to put a link to a Google Jamboard. And if you've used one before, it'd be obvious, but if you haven't, it's pretty self-explanatory once it goes on the screen. Cool. Okay. So there's uh, a link going to Jamboard. Just click on it and it will come here. So what I'd like you to do, please, just literally for a couple of minutes, is to use a sticky note, which you can get from the bottom left there, and then tell me what type of snow measurements do you need and what do you need them for? So we're just going to break probably for like two to three minutes just to allow people just to throw in their ideas and it allows you to have a little bit of time to reflect on what's being said and start to think well okay how does that affect what I do? So there's going to be a vast diversity of needs here. I'm already starting to see people saying, you know, thinking of gridded SWE on continental scales to think about, you know, your climate models. So we're not interested about what's happening in the millimeter scale. We're thinking about how does it change over maybe 0.5 by 0.5 degree grids. People thinking about potentially how does snow affect lake ice? And then how does that affect lake ice thickness? Because snow, it's a bit like putting like a duvet or like a blanket over the top, keeping it nice and warm or certainly shielding it from some of the harsh temperatures of the winter. Some people are interested in just saying, I need to know depth, and well, that's good. So we need microstructure. So if we're looking at airborne data, that's gonna, you know, if you know the depth, that's great, but you need to know the depth and something about the microstructure, otherwise you have an ill-posed problem in terms of being able to understand what the radar return is. Three, as I said, in terms of how it sort of densifies over time, particularly when that turns to fern and that will turn to accumulation on glaciers is absolutely critical to understanding the densification routines and also in particular how moisture affects those. Never been more important to know about that in Greenland recently. Avalanche is absolutely critical, yeah, so the massive snow and then the sort of those weak layers potentially impacting on that, so knowing a little bit about the microstructure and how that impacts on the SWE, yeah. Yeah, some interesting and really interesting stuff coming out about the cold content and thinking about sort of modeling and uh, cold content is a kind of a way of thinking like an accounting system of energy going in and energy being released. And at what point does the snowpack become ripe and become ready to start melting and getting that right is really important too. We'll just do it every one, I'll do one more. It comes in. Fundamentally, yeah, and a couple of people have mentioned this, whether it's for regional weather, water forecasting or catchment three, it's just about understanding how much water is there. Don't really need to know anything else, just know how much water is there and when it melts, how's that going to go into my reservoir while it's going in for use for hydroelectric power or for other purposes. That's great. Okay. That was a nice little breather. Um, so it's got 42 minutes gone, so we might have to speed up a little. But Julia, if you could now uh, change the screens and do that. So please keep putting stuff in if you wish, but we're going to keep moving on. Okay, right, so very quickly, <laughs> we're going to talk just a little bit about, well, how do we take these measurements? And in an actual snow school, this is what we'd spend a lot of time doing. Um, deep alpine snow packs. Generally, we use some form of SWE tube. Um, this is Hans-Peter Marshall of Boise State University modeling a, a wonderful, I think it's a federal sampler there. Lots of different words for it, but fundamentally, it's just a tube that you thrust into the snow and you get a sample of the snow out there. So next slide, please. So that's a tube, it's graded so that you can see um, the, the depth of the snowpack that you're pushing into. Um, it's also got a known mass and a known volume. Next slide. Thrust it into the snow, it's got a cutting edge on the bottom. Generally, you try and get a sort of a clod of soil. Next slide, please. Remove it with, uh, with, a, with a knife. So this is low tech, but uh, highly effective. Next slide. And then you weigh it. So because you know the volume, you know the mass without the snow, 
you know, the mass with the snow. It's calibrated to work out what the water equivalent is. And so you can very quickly go around taking um, point measurements of the bulk um, snow water equivalent. Next slide. You can do it a different way as well. So you can dig a pit and you can use a density cutter. And sometimes this is useful when you want to know a profile of density measurements. Next slide. And what you can do is use like a, a wedge cutter like that. And I'll show a few different slides, different types in the future. But fun back again, please. Thank you. But fundamentally, you just basically take, hopefully you can see on the left hand side, like a checkerboard arrangement of at least two um, samples at each layer. Generally, so, uh, cut it like that would be 10 centimeters in height, and you can then average them out so you get a profile of densities, and that gives you that little bit more awareness of what's going on. So it's all about the purpose you want to know, but if you want to know the change in the vertical profile density, this is a great way of doing it. Next slide. If you're looking at really small um, shallow snow packs, like in the Arctic, you wouldn't use that big wedge cutter. In fact, you use a very small box cutter. So that's Ken Tate there in the Two Lake Lake, uh, making a small density cutter. So that's 100 cubic centimeters rather than uh, uh, 1,000 cubic centimeters. And then using the scale that he's resting in his pelly case there. Next slide. And there are lots of different types of cutter, but I would say these are the these are three which are most common. So on the left hand side, we've got the box cutter. That's got three centimetre high depth, and that's really good for any shallow Arctic snowpacks. You can get good measurements generally within layers. But if you get much deeper, you tend to use more about the wedge shaped cutters on the right. So there's a great paper by Martin Potch there, which just kind of shows the pros and cons. But fundamentally, you're going to get a density measurement around about 7% accuracy. So that's the kind of tolerance level you're looking for. Next slide, please. Um, Thinking about vertical profiles of temperature in the snowpack. Now, I kind of alluded to that in some previous slide about metamorphism, but it's clearly important to know the difference between the temperature at the base of the snow and the top. Left hand side is the only one you really need to look at here, and that's looking at the difference in the change over a diurnal cycle. So, in the evening, when it gets cool and you get lots of long wave emission from the surface, those surface levels areas of snow will cool off really quick, and you'll get that temperature gradient really cooling off. Whereas in the day, that will whip around and start to increase. So the further you get away from the surface, the more muted the response is clearly to the air temperatures and the amount of incoming um, radiation. But understanding how that changes is really important, and that can have a big impact clearly on your modeling and remote sensing. Next slide, please. There are some really fancy techniques, new techniques, which will give you very high resolution information. So this is called snow micropenetrometer. This was developed at SLF in Davos in Switzerland. And in essence, hopefully on the left hand side, what you can see is something which is basically akin to a RAM penetrometer. So thinking about the strength of something as you're pushing it through a medium. And what this does is it basically drives this. Hopefully you can see the tip there, that, that nice point. It drives that um, sort of pressure load cell through the snow at a constant rate, and it measures the response, the breaking of the ice bonds at exceptionally high resolution, so 0.004 millimeters or so of resolution. And from that, we can start to derive some interesting metrics about the properties of the snow, which can then be used for quantitative models. That's really important uh, for remote sensing, and I think a future webinar is going to focus on that. So by basically driving this through the snowpack, you can start to retrieve some estimate of density, specific surface area that Alex will talk about in a second, and correlation length. Now, they mean, not, they mean nothing to you, but fundamentally, they're just different metrics to describe the structure of the air and the ice interfaces. So you can get a profile within a few minutes. Now, it's slightly, it gets often quite temperamental, but the point is you can get some exceptionally good measurements from this, and you can get large spatial coverage. Next slide, please. Another way which was, uh, a lot of people are starting to work on is snow casting. So this is when you get a substance called diethylphylate and you basically, you take a sample of snow out and you pour it within the snow itself. And within that, it casts it, so it holds it solid. And then you can put it in what essence is an MRI scanner. So if you needed to look inside the body, you would go into this resolution imaging scanner and it's in essence doing pretty much the same thing to a snow. So you can get a 3D rendering of your snow sample. Could you, yeah, great, we'll play that again. So this is a, a great video from SLS. And what they've done is they've taken a small cube of snow, they've put it in their uh, micro CT machine, and then they've, they've put across that sample a very strong temperature gradient. And then they've recorded the sample every hour. 
what you're seeing there, it looks like the snow is moving down the screen, where in fact that's not happening. What's happening is that metamorphism is happening where you have moisture going from lower to upper grains. Let's show it once more before we move on. And so you start from having quite a complex matrix there to becoming uh, much more like a sort of a depth hole style of crystal. And you can start to see there, you see lots of those sharp edges, lots of sort of the, the repetitive layers building up towards the base. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, Alex, I think you're up next for the next slide. Yeah, we'll try to wrap up in, in a couple of minutes. So basically from, from basically Nick talking about the microstructure layer in itself, if you go down to the, at the grain level, and this is actually very important because um, since we're using a lot of uh, microwave or radar or whatever frequency you're using to retrieve snow mass and, and depth and sweep, you rely on the scattering of your wavelength. And that scattering is caused mainly by the scatterers, which are the grains, individual grains. So as the model we're evolving over time, whether it's you know initially uh, MEMOS or HUT, HUT, uh, transfer model before and now SMRT, DMRT, um, you need to have a proper parameterization of microstructure and it started with the grain size. So as a community in you know, early 2000s, we kind of questions ourselves, well, everybody's using a different metric for grain size. So if you look at uh, the slides here and I'll, I'll give credit to a friend and colleague, uh, Florent de Minet, who some of you might know, basically what is, what is the grain size? And myself and during my PhD, you know, I digitized thousands and thousands of projected surface of grains over sea ice. Uh, so that would be the, the, the right grain, you know, in, in yellow. But what is your grain size? Is it the maximum radius, the minimum radius? Is it the ratio between the two, some sort of an eccentricity? Is it the projected surface? Is it the average of all the radius you can fit in, in, in your grain? And there's many, you know, polygon edge uh, detection method, uh, you know, whether it's Python, MATLAB, or whatever you're using, to do that kind of work. But as a community, we were kind of, you know, scattered, haha, uh, across the board for, for, for snow grain characterization. And that led to a lot of problems when it came to, um, to create those transfer models. So next slide is basically with the work of the past 10 years, trying to agree on a more standard metric, you know, which would be the optical diameter or, or equivalent specific surface area. Specific surface area is the surface to volume ratio. Um, basically, the surface being what's available to gas, if it's exposed to gas, and there are methods using methane absorption techniques in labs to describe or quantify the surface, um, divided by the volume of the snow grain. So often an equivalent spherical size, grain size is used where you can have an SSA uh, linked to the sphere of uh, the surface of the volume of the sphere and then the volume of the sphere times the density of ice since it's a snow grain, so 917 uh, kilogram per cubic meter. So very high surface for a snowflake, but very low volume, so very high SSA, whereas the ratio, if you take a perfect sphere, then it's very low. So your big cups, your facets, or your depth or grains will have low SSA values that will range anywhere between, uh, you know, a couple hundreds to, to 10 or 12 or 15, I know some of the range might be larger than this, but I personally never measured uh, outside of these ranges. Uh, on the next slide, you know, to provide a, a broader idea of the values you can get, obviously fresh snow, highest SSA values you can get. And then as you start to get metamorphism ongoing, I think that was a question in the chat from, from Jessica early on, the effect of sublimation on the grains or microstructure. So basically you have Evapor sublimation, evaporation on the edges because there are convex, high uh, saturation vapor pressure and that mass is being redistributed elsewhere in the, in the grains, so in the concave areas. So basically the impact is um, either centering between two grains or basically a rounding of, of a grain itself. So that decreases SSA because you're decreasing surface to volume ratio. So refrozen snow depth or at the bottom of the grid will have be your lowest SSA value. Um, the way to measure this on the next slide is basically using the fact that SSA is linked to albedo. So albedo is the reflectance. So we use reflectance in, well, obviously you have a spectral signature of snow. So we use the, um, the albedo in the infrared. So near infrared or short wave infrared. And if you like at the near infrared, uh, seven to 750 to 800 nanometers, then you can see on the graph that the sensitivity to SSA or variability in SSA is quite low. And then you can see if you go, you know, between 1100 and 1500, 
then the sensitivity to you know changing grain size, changing SSA, is is increased. So basically, this is where you want to go to have a proper measurement on on your um, on your albedo, and then from the albedo you can derive your SSA. So various devices on the next slide that have been developed, you know, by various members in a community uh, that all you know use the same principle of uh, you know albedo to um, SSA or optical diameter. So the DUFIS, which is uh, maybe some of you know the ice cube uh, device, the laser device. So DUFIS is uh, the father of ice cube, which again, uh, Florent Dominique provided the slides. So he's the one with his uh, master's student, Joshua Gallet, who developed that uh, several years ago. Uh, the POSUM ASAP are uh, two devices that use laser as well, but basically you need to drill a hole. So Antarctica, Greenland, you know, tens of meters deep or hundred meter deep then you can have a profile of your grains. And then you have um, the iris, which is equivalent of doofus, and then eventually photography. So on the next slide, the, the principle of the laser uh, reflectance basically is you send a laser beam to a, a sample, a snow sample. So for those who have seen uh, iris in the field, that's uh, on the right middle picture with the red shirt, the top is doofus, the father uh of the device and uh, on the left is how it works so you have this laser beam that you know illuminates the surface and the laser being scattered in an integrating sphere and then you can take your measurements of your voltage on the photodiode so in order to transfer the voltages to reflectance then you need to have a calibration targets so we use the small uh, spectral arms or lab sphere uh known reflectance targets and then you can do a calibration. So you have, let's say, a 2% of 20, 50, 80% reflectance known targets. And then you have a, a relationship to voltage. And then you just do a statistical fit, six degree polynomial if you want to overkill it, or linear regression if you're happy with, with uh, <laughs> simpler things. But nonetheless, you can have an equation derived, you know, deriving uh, reflectance of uh, your signal grain or at least your sample. So on the next slide, when you have uh, instruments such as ASAP or, or POSUM, then it's the same principle where that sphere or that device will go down in the hole and eventually shoot laser on the surface on its side and then measure the reflectance coming back in and then be able to retrieve your, your reflectance. On the next slide, you, you have the same device, but a shorter, uh, shorter, um, shorter version. So you can only do like two meters near the surface. So I believe this is Florent de Minet on the left picture somewhere in Greenland, likely summit. And uh, on the right is the same, uh, you can see uh, the ASAP. That was uh, one of our the field mission on Barnes Ice Cap um, in Baffin Island several years ago. So those devices are quite robust, but at least as a community, we now agree that this is one of the best field methods approach to be able to derive some grain size information. Uh, on the next slides, the photography now, as Nick stated a bit earlier, so you can have uh, basically what you don't see with the naked eye, right? So you can see layering, you can see different layers, some small crusts that otherwise would just be white if you look at them uh, with the naked eye. Uh, theoretically, since you're in the near infrared, like 750 or 800 nanometers, theoretically you can derive reflectance in SSA or optical diameter than SSA. Uh, problem with that frequency, as I mentioned before, is the sensitivity is quite low to grains. So you need, you know, very, very controlled conditions uh, to take your measurements and your control your lighting and stuff like that. On the next slide, uh, you can then switch to a higher wavelength where it's very sensitive as a camera. So that's photos with the in-gas camera. And when you compare on the right with the crosses, which are the Dufus ice cube or iris samples, um, you can get a good match, but those cameras need power, need computer, the power, the, the cable will snap in the cold. So it's, um, and then there's a halo around the in gas. It's very, very complicated. So I personally prefer to go back with the small iris or ice cube or doofus uh, systems. And um, yeah, I think we have. Uh, We've got a few a more minutes more left and so. Uh, I realize from the chat that not necessarily everyone was able to log on to the Jamboard. It should, you shouldn't have to upload anything. You should be able just to get it there from the web. But if Judy, you could put on the second one. Um, the really, you don't need to join in on this, but if you don't want to, but what it is, it's for a moment of reflection and just to think, okay, this has been a whistle stop tour of an awful lot of techniques. Um, so thought processes about how often do I measure? Where do I measure? What do I measure? I'm just trying to relate it again to what you might want to do. So um, 
if you go to yes as you can see there Julie is toggling between the two frames so if you go to frame number two can I just ask people to go there and say what type of measurement might you use or what kind of problems might it address so if you can get on and you can answer something that would be brilliant and it'd be, under, it'd be really interesting for us to understand the breadth and the range of what people who have attended today might wish to use this for. Or if you can't, or you don't wish to, have a look at what other people are putting on and contrast it potentially with what your needs are for snow measurements or snow modeling or potentially remote sensing. Hmm. Yes, the magnophobe. Um, we didn't dwell on that because it's an, it's a fun, it's an automated uh, depth probe. Um, fine, fine machine. Um, making lots of depth measurements very quickly with uh, a GPS coordinate attached to them. Very good. Yeah, nice to see UAV's, uh, UAV's approaches. You know, this is emerging a lot. We work a lot, I work with this in my lab and we run into problems running UAVs in the Arctic. So very harsh conditions, you run into the problems where off the shelf UAVs such as DJI, rely on, uh, on on a compass to fly and then and as you get closer to the magnetic pole then your flight plan doesn't hold anymore so you need 100 percent gps systems and uh given you know the harsh conditions in the wind and the cold it's a different ball game on 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 the batteries so a lot of work right now uh, being conducted very interesting on on, on um, you know winterizing uavs yeah Lots of people talking about the necessity for getting measurements of snow properties. And as there was a conversation in the chat, don't forget your shovel. Of getting you taking a shovel as one is the key thing to dig into it and understand what's going on. Spending some time in snow is really important, particularly if you're modeling snow or you're remote sensing snow. You can all, you can all regularly make some appalling errors of judgment in parameterization or in contextualization of what you're looking at if you don't have at least a feel for what is going on in the snowpack. So even if potentially your science or your practitioner, uh, that you're not going into the field, um, if you get an opportunity, you do try and do so, at least to try and understand and get a feel for some of the complexity that we have to simplify. Uh, often I've heard parameters call us buckets to store our ignorance in, and often they are because we're trying to take a, something which is a really complex situation and then uh, place them into single numbers to make a model work. Yeah, I see calibrating remote sensing with with, uh, with ground measurements. That's you know the most challenging part because you really need. We're not hearing you at the moment, Alex. Alex, I can't hear you. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is, maybe this is the webinar's way of saying. <laughs> Alex, can you try unmuting and muting yourself just to see if that toggles it? You can't hear us either. Okay. It seems as though the participants are hearing Alex, so sorry for the interruption. <laughs> oh, well, in either case, this may be a good time to call it. Um, we're two minutes over, but thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. And please feel free to continue adding things to the Jamboard. Um, and potentially joining the quasi Slack channel, it could be an opportunity to speak more with colleagues and other interested um, folks about some of these ideas. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and put on the quasi YouTube channel um, later this evening, in case you wanna review anything that we went over today. Um, but a huge thank you to Alex and Nick um, as our speakers today for sharing their expertise and um, join us next month um, on the last Friday of February, same time, same link um, for the next installment in this Introduction to Snow Hydrology webinar series. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>